Good morning. It is a dreary Wednesday morning with a little bit of uh, rain outside, but inside I've been studying 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, that whole chapter on uh, the resurrection and specifically Christ's resurrection. And I wanted to share a segment of that study with you. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> there we go. And I want to go back, take a step back and talk a little bit about process. Um, we have uh, talked before about a general outline for studying the Bible. And uh, one of the first steps right here, identify and record the general materials used in this book. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is using ideological material. Now, we have studied poetry, we've studied prophecy, we've studied uh, history. There are three main categories of materials. Biographical, that would be what happens in um, both, uh, uh, to an extent, uh, uh, Samuel in Kings, but especially in um, the Gospels. Historical material also occurs in uh, Samuel and Kings and in places like the Book of Acts. Biographical and historical material can be arranged chronologically, geographically, or topically. So the difference between biographical and historical material, biographical focuses on people, historical focuses on events. So the book of Judges, we get events, but it's arranged primarily around the biographies of certain individuals. Its arrangement is by and large geographical, not necessarily chronological, at least chronology is not important in the book of Judges. Much more important are the tribes that are affected. In the Gospels, it's biographical because it's looking at Jesus, and Luke proceeds largely chronologically Matthew and Mark proceed largely geographically. Then we get ideological material. Now, what we're studying here in 1 Corinthians 15 is ideological. The reason that's important is when we see logical materials like 1 Corinthians 15, we pay attention particularly to repetitions causes and effects, and general declarations. Metaphors and similes are much less important uh, when we move to poetical material. Uh, ideas are important, but so are images equally important, and so metaphors and similes, comparisons and contrasts become important. So we kind of know what we're looking for. And as we work our way through the section, now's a good time if you want, stop and read through the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, but pay particular attention to this section that we're going to study, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 20. If you have just restarted the video, let's start looking at the relations that we find here. The initial but that uh, Paul presents is uh, really just an introduction to a new topic. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For, and in this case, for introduces a series of arguments that Paul has. 
here's the first argument. If there is no, if there is no resurrected agenda of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And second argument, if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. Here we get the word useless that um, is repeated. We will see this once more in this passage. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we've said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true. Contrast. If there is no resurrection from the dead. Now, we come back here after this short um, uh, excursion here. All our preaching is useless. Let's kind of separate that because this does become important. Your faith is useless, and we apostles would be lying. Uh, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. If you will look, that's a pure repetition of this phrase up here. So what we could say is that this is Um, let's call that R1. We'll see why in a second. This is R2. And we come back to R1 here. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raid, raised. And if, if you'll notice, Christ has not been raised, it's a repetition of this here. If Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. Well, here he repeats this phrase, your faith is useless. So we get the repetition of useless again. And you're still guilty of your sins going to do that. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And this is a further development. If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But, oh, let's, let's get these, the, the if-thens, And then is kind of understood here. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He's the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So take a look at this. Do you see how this is repeated here? Because Paul got sidetracked talking about this. And then this is repeated here. Now he's back on track, so he says this. So as we look at this whole passage and come down here to make our observations, what we can say is this. Paul starts with a statement. Christ rose from the dead. We preach that Christ rose from the dead. You see where that comes? Christ rose from the dead. But the Corinthians present obstacle. Their first response to Paul saying Christ rose from the dead. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. The, the obstacle 
is um, some of you say there is no such thing as resurrection. And now we get Paul's response. So his first response is, if there's no such thing as resurrection, Christ has not been resurrected. His second is that if Christ has not been resurrected, then our preaching is useless. Your faith is useless. We are still guilty of our sin. And we are to be pitied. And Paul's final response is, is to say, but Christ has been raised from the dead. And he is only the first. Uh, the implication here is that we will be too. And indeed, that's what the rest of the chapter is about. How Paul's proof that Christ has been raised from the dead. And also Paul's statement that he's only the first. We will also be resurrected. This final response actually ends up being a thesis statement for the whole chapter. Christ has been raised from the dead, and he is only the first. Now, do you see these uh, if-then statements? What, uh, what we're looking at here is this. In the document, Structural Relations, uh, in this section on result, causes, and effects, we talk about the if-then statements. And one of the things down here that we talk about is um, when we have several if-then statements together, we might have the repetition of reason or result, or we might have a chain of reason or result. In this case, if this is true, then that is true. Christ has not been resurrected. Then if Christ has not been resurrected, then our preaching is useless. Your faith is useless, and we're still guilty of our sin. And if this is true, then this is also true. This is actually our three. We are to be pitied if we are still guilty of our sin, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, then we are to be pitied. So here is a chain of result. Okay. The important thing to see here is the repetition of these reasons. R1, or these responses, R1 is repeated, R2 is repeated, and then we get R3. As we take a passage, as we have here, and we uh, tear that passage apart, we can begin to see these repetitions that do occur. That's all I wanted to share today. Um, be hopeful. Christ indeed has been resurrected. So shall we one day. God bless you. I'll see you the next time.